2,000 years later. Oh, what's up, Matt? What up, what up? How you doing? Ready for breakfast? Yeah, have some uh, peanut butter and toast. Peanut Get butter sandwiches. Let's yeah. go. Hey. Morning, mate. How you doing? Good morning. So, what's the plan for today? The plan is, I'm going to hit gym, and then we'll probably go over a few things with the academy. I think I'm recording money supply video this way, uh, today. And then maybe, just because you're over, make it feel <laughs> a bit more exciting. And we'll go over, potentially, some distribution stuff on cool. the positions that I think we can do this weekend. So weekend markets are closed, so... It's time to do our analysis. Perfect time. Let's see how things go. Got a watch list going. That's it. Build up our watch list. Pressure That's ideas. Good. And see what we can do with the portfolio. That's it. We're having breakfast now and we'll probably hit gym after that. Mm. See you there. Copies. Let's get it going. What's up? Just finished at the gym. Now we're actually going to go <coughs> head over to Curry's PC World, pick up some gear and then I'm going to get my hair cut because it's looking a bit long, looking nice and pretty for you guys and then we'll get into the good stuff actually on what we actually do during our normal day and that's with trading and logic effects stuff. So let's get yeah. to it. Let's get to it. Let's do some fun. Hopefully Ooh. there's no sharp turns and the camera stays still. Turns out PC World, Curry's didn't have Huawei's memory sticks, so we're just gonna have to make do. More memory cards. Yeah, so we're just gonna have to make do. Transfer onto a fucking external hard drive. Just gonna. Mark is gonna get a trim. Yeah, get a haircut, sort this all out, and uh, we got spotted in Curry's. They thought we were vloggers. Unfortunately, we're not. We're just, <laughs> yeah, friendly neighborhood traders. <laughs> you know how it is. That's it. So yeah, we're just gonna go get my haircut now. We'll head back and then probably get in some good content for you guys on exactly what I do throughout my day and some probably secret revealing things that you never thought that a trader would do compared to, or contrary, popular belief. So it'll be quite insightful for you guys, hopefully. See you there. Might see Peace. some clips, clips of his haircut as well. <laughs> Turns out the barbers is actually closed as well. It's just not our day today. That's what you get for training legs on Sunday. <laughs> the closed barber shop. Everything's fucking closed. We'll just have to go head back. <sighs> head back, shower up. Get straight into the uh, content. Stuff that's interesting. structuring the presentations so you know, we're halfway through making the academy content so this video we're going to go through the money supply and then after that i'm just going to update my portfolio know what i'm going to do tomorrow maybe uh, with my positions so watch this wise get the logic strategy scores conduct relative analysis on um, oil and iron ore which i think are important for the positions that i'm looking to take then potentially on Monday I might have one or two positions available, which is very fortunate because not every week we get that. So 
quite a good time. It seems like volatility is fairly high in the market. So there's quite a few steps and preparations I'll need to do for those positions, like making sure that, you know, one with volatility, I actually prepare for it properly. What are my portfolio stop loss? So what currencies have you got in mind? Um, currencies I've got in mind. Just pull up my uh, watch list right now. My portfolio, my watch list. So I've got CAD Swiss Franc, uh, US dollar versus Swedish Krona, and Australian dollar, US dollar. So these three main positions. I'm going to conduct relative analysis, still need to do that at the moment. The only one that's potentially looking favourable right now that already has price action in favour in terms of the weekly returns. It's not the typical price action that you see, retail traders see. Um, that's looking good. So CAD Swiss franc may be something I enter on Monday. Don't know yet. Uh, we'll see. We'll have to do a bit more analysis after we've done the uh, presentation work. Cool. It's looking good. So what do you think is a major retail trader mistake? Just off the top of your head. Major retail trader mistake. I would probably go um, with something that I actually fell into when I was like 15 or 16 is believing that the free information online was genuine um, and didn't have a hidden agenda behind it. So I started to read a lot of free resources, actually buy books that were highly recommended on Amazon, go through them, realize that they're all pushing sort of price action only and time series analysis, which I already studied in university. And I assumed it was capable of forecasting the market when really after a year and a half, I realized actually you do need to start looking at fundamentals and macroeconomic um, overall themes because that's what decides what happens in the future, not what previous price is saying. So I think major retail traders, their main mistake is purely focusing on technical analysis to forecast when its actual use is to time positions and your forecasting should come from underlying macroeconomic themes. Really important to grasp, I feel like, um, you know, we've done podcasts on this, Matty. Mm. We've done, you know, two to three hour videos out in the academy on this. It's a big topic. There's a huge broken narrative. So conflict mm -hmm. of interest everywhere. Best thing to do if you're new to the market, due diligence, always think to yourself, how is the person or the information on the other side making money? It's a free website. Who's endorsing it? Whose adverts are on there? Is it the brokers? If it is, then you have to be wary. Are they actually encouraging me to trade frequently in high volume to make the brokers more revenue. End of the day, the brokers are a business and they're just there to take your money. So you've got to be aware of that. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. Yeah. I think that, that'll do for that one then. And we can go straight into time. is um, how do you do your analysis what are your steps and how is it different to regular retail traders um, essentially uh, the approach that we take at logic Pegs, the approach that I actually teach people the approach that I take um, is looking at the market on a fundamental basis primarily so instead of looking at the price chart I'll probably spend 5% of my time actually looking at the price chart. Majority of the time I'm working through my spreadsheets, downloading uh, government reports, data from our paid resources on economies, put all of that into our um, qualitative scoring system, the logic strategy, where we start to look at the endogenous drivers. Those are just drivers about each economy. So once we can value, let's say the US, uh, Norway, the UK, the U Europe region, and we get an idea of how each economy is performing, I can actually come to some decisions. So the first thing I actually do, I wake up Saturday morning, update our software that actually pulls all the data and pushes it through our scoring system that we've already made, get the scores for each economy. And then from that, 
I gauge which pairs are most likely to be volatile over the next three to four months. So I do that once a week. And once I've done that, combine them, and then I start looking at the imports and exports, a bit of relative analysis, uh, trade balance analysis, and essentially looking at how those overall themes affect my positions. And this is purely for currency market. Equity market have a different structure. Essentially, it's a top-down approach. Mm -hmm. And then once I've gone through that whole process, set up a watch list, get that watch list running, have a portfolio with a maximum of five to 10 currency positions, depending on my uh, position limits, I adjust them depending on my Kelly criteria. And then I essentially uh, swap out my losers for fresh ideas. So after a month or so, if my position's not going how I want it to do, cut it short and put it with fresh idea that I've got waiting, that's in fruition. And then that's essentially how I actually make my portfolio and build it out. So if you look at the financial markets or trading, that's how professionals would do in an investment back or hedge fund. So it's just a normally averagely accepted approach if you know what you're doing. Whereas I think in contra contrast, you asked me, how is it different from retail traders? I think they have really concentrated portfolios. They probably wake up flat in the morning and they will literally have a look at Euro USD because it's the most popular pair, which, you know, you tell a hedge fund manager or someone who knows what they're doing, you're trading Euro USD, they'll be like, that's the least volatile pair, so why are you even touching that? You ain't gonna get any money. And they'll probably look at that, look at a little few, you know, price action things and enter positions, which I feel like is non-sustainable. It may work in the short term, like, you know, playing roulette works in the short term, but eventually, after a few weeks or months, like majority of retail traders within like 90 odd days, they realize, hold on a second, it was all luck in the first place and they just lose all the capital and it's just, you know, non-sustainable portfolio stuff. So yeah, that, that's the way I look at it. And I only use technical analysis rarely to potentially look at timing my fundamental ideas. So and the main things that I use, uh, the relative strength index and supply and demand zones to see if price is favorable um, in terms of historical price. You know, Mr. Market approaches me and if he gives me a low value price, that's good because fundamentally I've already got an idea of what I'm doing. So I already know what I'm doing before I even look at the chart. That's where my work. I say about five to six hours on a Saturday is analyzing it, and what's happened in the past week, and then the remaining remaining time throughout the week is potentially just flipping open the charts and checking whether the price action itself aligns with what I already want to do. And if it does, I potentially have an idea. And I look to hold my position from anywhere between three to six months. So, you know, I can allow the market volatility to change and price to actually capture that. So for example, the average price move in a currency pair over three months be about 10 to 15%. So that's non-leveraged. So you do the math, you leverage two times, you potentially capture a turn of 30% off one currency pair. So as long as you have a portfolio of five, it's sufficient to get excellent returns, provided you know what you're doing. So that's essentially how set my portfolio. Cool. So I got another question. Go for it. What would be your three recommended books and why? Three recommended books. I think the best one is first to get your mindset right, you know, and that would be thinking fast and slow. Once you've gone through a psychological book like that from such an author like Daniel Kahneman, who goes into in-depth explanations with evidence on why the brain works the way it does and System 1, System 2, read the book, you know what I'm talking about. It gives you an insight now into how to be self-reflective and project and look at yourself and be critical because I feel like if you want to succeed in anything, especially trading, you need to be looking at yourself and see if you're being objective or not, especially when making decisions. Were you influenced by a Trump speech? And was it, you know, a sort of positive influence or negative influence? How did it actually prime you to make a decision? And those sort of things you can only understand and actually start implementing once you've read texts and you know works of people who allow you to understand it a lot better and easier and understand sort of tricks and things that you fall for you know best example that we actually going to do in one of the workshops is about the ball example you know your brain if it's if i say to you what was the example matty or something like if a bat and a ball cost one pound ten yeah the bat costs one pound more than the ball how much does the ball cost no Anyone watching this, I guarantee you're going to say 10p. The answer is 5p. Go home and work it out. You're going to sit there for about half an hour thinking, what the hell, how's it 5p? Right? Just, you know, this is the thing 
or things that psychology and cognitive analysis, behavioral finance, all these new theories that come out in the past 20 years, they touch upon. That's the first book I'd definitely recommend just because it gives you a good foundation to start building your knowledge upon. You know? um, next book will probably be uh, Benjamin Graham's um, Intelligent Investor. Uh, it essentially, I think I've got it back here somewhere. Oh, it's over there. Essentially, what it does is it gives you a nice insight into the brokerage agenda on how you know day trading was purposely made um, by the New York Stock Exchange to convince people. You know, celebrities would say, "Hey, I've made this much from stock trading," or you know, trading in and out every day. Convince people that's what they do. Movies and agendas made like that to just convince the layman, the normal person, the retail trader, essentially fall in that trap. So I feel like that book outlines that aspect great and it teaches you core concept of value investing. So great book. I feel like if you're ever going to get into the equity market or you're just literally a normal person doesn't want to learn how to trade or wants to learn how to manage their money and you currently have a wealth manager or financial planner or financial advisor and he's ripping you off, <laughs> this book literally tells you everything that they do anyway. So, you know, great book. And I'd say the third book is the one I'm actually work working through right now, which is this monstrosity over here, which is Security Analysis. And this was written by Graham also, and it's a lot more in-depth and intelligent investor. And it goes into his approach to valuing a company and essentially how you can capture that. And there's quite a few important rules. I actually write them on my whiteboard regularly so I don't forget, but you know, this is the importance of say cognitive analysis, you know. You can have a bunch of rules, you can have a system, but if you don't actually stick to it and understand when things aren't going your way, if you don't have the confidence in your analysis, you got What's up, dude? What have you been doing? You caught me at the pretty interesting time. Just been doing a relative analysis cool. on the Aussie dollars. You remember earlier I mentioned it? So I thought, go through everything. So I'll uh, well hey. walk you through now, actually. So just finished it up. So um, what we're looking at, essentially, when you get a fundamental idea. So if I just show you, let's say, the uh, LogicFX portal. And we just go into here. Just let me know if you can see. Yep. Yeah. So, what I normally do is pull the logic strategy scores from the website. So, for United States, we've got a negative score. And Australia, you can see we've got a positive score changes. And these are updated on a weekly basis. So, I'll update my spreadsheets if you just want to pan over to this screen over here. I update my logic strategy scores every week. And then I highlight the ones which are significant to me then I add them to my watch list on the dates and I also add in the commitments of traders analysis probably another video cool on to that. long story short came up with the idea of longing the Aussie dollar US dollar on an endogenous basis on just looking at it absolutely that's not enough to make a trade just an idea so relative analysis what I came up with is a essentially compare their growth rates as an economy. So right here, we're looking at the gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. I get the real growth rate of America and compare it to uh, the growth, growth rate of Australia. And that essentially gives us a differential in growth rates as a percentage. And then what I do is actually score that and the most recent data um, you can get for it's updated yearly, essentially GDP rates or quarterly. And the IMF do forecasts over the next year and whatnot, so you can use their forecast value. Then we score that accordingly. And currently it's saying that there's slight um, deflation and we predict um, inflation in Australia. So we have a slight short bias on Aussie dollar, US dollar there on a relative basis. So then what I do is actually put all of this information into an overall scorecard, which you can see here. And we have a look at the growth rates as an economy, their trade analysis, which I'll just go for in a second. Uh, the interest rate differentials and carry really important especially if you're holding positions for long periods which you should be if you're looking to have a sustainable portfolio and then we have the uh, stock market returns of relative wealth 
So I'll just go over the trade analysis now. Essentially, if you've got an idea about two economies, you want to know the import and export market inside out. And that's a balance of trades and the major commodities that they export. So Australian dollar, really good uh, currency. It's a commodity floating currency. So that nature of the course, you probably, uh, if you're a student, you would have gone through all that stuff. Iron ore is a major thing that Australia exports. So our job then, or my job, is to actually analyze iron ore. So I pull up the data for the AD USD exchange rate, which you can see here, uh, get the iron ore prices. I then divide that by 100 so that I can get it on a relative scale, plot the data against each other. So if you, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but there's an orange line that represents the iron ore price and a blue line that represents the Aussie dollar, US dollar price. What I've noticed recently, so we're now in end of August, at the start of September, so we've got July's data, and we've seen iron ore prices dramatically increasing. So this to us is a sign that Aussie dollar, US dollar should appreciate because they're really highly correlated on a historical basis going you know, as far back as data really goes. And whenever there has been a divergence, what I mean, I mean by that is iron ore prices going up, but Aussie dollar, US dollar staying the same or depreciating, we have a sort of circumstance where we can get a really good value trading, but we have to be patient and wait for the weekly volatility returns to actually go in our favor. So right now, I've actually scored this and I've done a distribution analysis. So this basically tells us a relationship. We know there's a positive correlation. So we conduct a distribution of returns of that. It's a bit of statistical analysis and we essentially find a scoring system based on a uh, average positive return, average negative return for the iron ore prices. When they fall between bounds of uh, different degrees of standard deviation, we can generate a bias. So the latest data, we actually have a 10.37% uh, what we call percentage return on iron ore. And that falls within between our one and two standard deviations on our analysis, which is an exceptionally high sort of conviction that we want to long the Aussie dollar, US dollar, because historically it's told us the relationship between the two, that they should follow suit. So iron ore is appreciating by so much, Aussie dollar, US dollar should eventually follow suit. Whether it's this month or in the next couple months, we have to keep an eye on it. And there's a few other filtration processes I go in after I've got this trade idea. And then I, look at the interest rates between the economies, calculate a differential, and then from that, I look at the change in that differential. So it's all well and good looking at the differential and see if it's positive or not, but then you wanna look at it in the previous uh, sector, so the past month or so, was it greater or, or fewer? So essentially, what we found here is that the differential has actually been decreasing. And when I go over to my scoring cell, might be a bit confusing if you've seen this for the first time, but essentially I just score all this information and it's given us a score around this region here, a really high conviction to short the Aussie dollar, US dollar. Now it's a contradiction to the iron ore stuff. So this is why it's important to do this relative analysis because on our logic strategy scores, you could say there's a high conviction, long bias when you combine the currency pairs. When you look on a relative basis on the trade analysis, looking at the interest rate differentials, and you start looking at it on a comparative status that you need to start thinking, oh, there's a few contradictions here. Maybe my position size needs to be lower. Maybe I need to wait. Maybe this market is not actually ready for this idea. So it's all well and good being fundamentally long or short. If the market ain't ready, it ain't going anywhere. So you need to analyze these factors to know that. And then I look at the stock market returns. So essentially top 200 companies in Australia, pull the prices from Yahoo Finance. Just pull around that, you can actually have a look there. So Yahoo Finance, you can get the S&P versus the AX200, the AXJO. We get the most recent prices. And what we essentially do in this analysis is look at where it is in comparison to the most recent high on a US dollar basis. So the Australian stock market is priced in Aussie dollars. What you need to do then is convert that to US dollars, which we have done here. And then you can look at it on a comparative basis now in AUSD. So I've got a chart on the screen right here, compare the stock market of Australia to the Aussie dollar, US dollar exchange rate. You can see they're pretty much correlated. So it's a very good leading indicator of the exchange rate. So obviously what do we do as traders? Analyze this shit. 
So we have a look at this and we compare it to the most recent high, which was around 2nd February 2018. And we'd say that the performance of the stock market on a US dollar basis has dropped by minus 7%. Now, what that means for me is I have a look at my scoring scale based, this scoring scale is based on my machine learning and historical data and work out what sort of scale. It's always changing only by slight margins every year or so. So we're going to update it. But essentially right now, what that's telling me is that there's a short bias for the Aussie dollar, US dollar on a fundamental equity sort of outlook. So then all of this put together, we get what's called the relative overall scorecard. We put all the points in, saw at the start, and then got minus 10. Now, what does that mean for me then? Right, it's on my watch list, but what does that mean? Minus 10 on the relative analysis means I should be shorting Aussie dollar, US dollar. Well, what I do is create an overall outlook. And my overall outlook is, I look at the logic strategy scores. It's telling me 25 for the Aussie dollar, minus seven for the US. I then have the uh, relative scores here. I put them in and then to create the net score for each economy for Australia, I actually sum the relative score for the Aussie dollar and I actually take it away for the US dollar. And that's because Aussie dollar is the numerator and US dollar is the denominator in the currency pair. So that's the way you have to combine them. And what this gives us is an overall bias then on each pair. So here, this is actually long now, let's just put in long. And this one is actually neutral. So really good that I did this analysis and I didn't enter the position because I had a fundamental idea. I've done my relative analysis and it's telling me, keep it on the watch list. I need to keep watching it over the next couple of weeks as long as the price action shows stability, goes in my favor, maybe positive, start looking at my filtration processes after the idea actually becomes a solid idea based on all the things I've just been through. So that's what I've just done, Matty, long as hell, but it needs to be done every weekend before you enter positions. This is sort of stuff that will actually minimize those losses and capture that maximum volatility on those trades that start trending. And that's what you really want to be doing. Yeah, that makes so much sense as well. Yeah. Thanks for the explanation. No worries. So essentially, you've done the endogenous analysis, which is just analyzing countries on their own. Yeah. And you've come to the conclusion that Australia is strengthening, mm -hmm. US is weakening. Was it? Yep. That's yep. It. And then after you've done that on an economy basis, you've now looked into them relatively. Yes. So you're comparing them against each other and that's what you're trying to explain here in the relative analysis. Yeah. And that's what you did with the INR and the interest rate differentials, the mm -hmm. relative GDP growth. And then you've created this new score, which is long AUD and a new neutral bias on US dollar. And then you've created this new score, which is long AUD and a new neutral bias on US dollar. Yes. So my conviction now on that long idea is actually lower because of my relative analysis. Yeah. So I'm now putting it and leaving it on the watch list for this week. Come back to it next week, do everything again and see if it's actually ready to put this idea cool. into a position and deploy capital so, to it. So even though the logic strategy scores signaled that long bias, you're still keeping it on the watch list because of relative analysis, yes. as it still has that same weighting. You know, you need to be patient. You need to wait for those confirmations and you don't want to be early in the market, right? Because as you said, exactly. it, you said it earlier, what was it? If the market's not ready, yeah, it literally, moving. <laughs> it literally, if it, it doesn't matter what sort of idea you have, right? And this is why, you know, people who short the S&P are actually batshit crazy, in my opinion, because 80 to 90% of the time is going up, right? So <laughs> even if you think you've got some secret information, if someone else with a lot of money doesn't believe the same thing, the price isn't gonna move in the direction that you want it. So true. And this is why the commitments of traders report is so valuable to retail traders. This is why the order flows so important to investment banks, because we're not an investment bank, we don't have market making facilities to look at order flow. So the best thing we've got is a COT report. And this is why I always look at that as well. And nothing significant I'm just looking. I'm just looking over there because I've got my um, my watch list there. I was just double checking on my recent COT flips, which we have to talk on YouTube about. It, the US dollar and the Aussie dollar haven't flipped recently, so mm. to me, there hasn't been a significant shift in the market sentiment to actually put this idea into something that could last a long time. So if mm. I were to enter, I probably wouldn't hold it for six months. More likely to be two to three months based on that. So. 
these are sort of things you need to be considering and yeah for the long term moves right that's it and now I've basically updated my portfolio watch list can start making the video which I was meant to make earlier for money supply which I've actually finished the presentation for I'll just show you so anybody who's going to be taking the academy you'll be learning this stuff um, and it's basically how we score the logic strategy and just make this bigger you can actually see what's going on and it's just a presentation where I'll be going through tutorials on how you actually score money supply, why it's useful, and how it's like the classic monetary lever to injections and withdrawals within the economy. So this sort of thing, you know, is what you'll be doing if you want to succeed Ooh. in the forex market or any market that matter. You know, that's so, yeah. the main thing that retail traders are missing out on, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like this sort of thing is day in day out for a certain value. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've spoke to a single retail trader. Um, or someone who's new to the market that does stuff like this and it's because they don't have friends who work in investment banks they've never actually worked in a fund and realized that hold on a second Google's telling me professional traders just literally look at signals or look at a pretty pattern on a chart when really that's just their perception of a professional trader to push an agenda real professional traders the guys who earn salaries that work for the big, the big funds they are all doing stuff like this and those are guys that make money so I feel like you know, our normal routine, which feels normal to us, might feel real alien to people watching this who are trading the markets but don't have a clue what we're talking about. Mm. Try to make it really simple for you guys, but you know, these sort of things, they are easy to grasp once you know what you're doing. But if you look at it for the first time, you might be thinking, Jesus, it's a lot of work just to make one currency position. Well, yeah, if you trade in the market, it's the person who puts in the most thought behind their idea is most likely going to make the most money. Mm. And that's what counts. So. Information war, as some hedge fund managers put it. Yes, that's right. And I feel like retail traders aren't even using what's available to them. All so the true. information and analysis I did on a relative basis here, all free on the internet. Apart from the logic strategy scores, of course, they're, they're mm. something that we made up. We, we teach you exactly how to make this, and you can use simple fundamental ideas um, from a global macro remit to come up with these scores. And I just use the automatic algorithm we make. It saves me a whole bunch of time. Like the relative analysis alone is taking me six or seven hours. Mm -hmm. So calculating these scores every week, I literally wouldn't be able to run a business. I'd, I'd be the guy working in a hedge fund getting paid a salary because it takes a full-time job to work out these scores here. The, about so true. So uh, yeah, mate. That's cool. That's everything Thanks that we did so far. No worries, man. No worries. What else you got planned for today then? Uh, so I'll probably finish this up, uh, record a few videos, go downstairs maybe do a bit of reading you know learn a few more things probably get through this book a bit and cool. then um we'll see what the evening takes us maybe Wicked. play some video games with you see how it goes. Yeah. Wicked. we'll see you then cool mate Peace. see ya what up marcus oh what, what's up mate what you been doing man uh literally right now just updating um my diary for my tasks to do tomorrow monday morning Wicked. so uh you know, with positions and stuff, and with business-related stuff, getting the academy content ready. Hey, yeah. that's sick. So, what have you what have you got planned for the whole day then? Well, usual routine: wake up in the morning, hit gym. Straight out of gym, we'll start editing presentations, making the video content, and then looking at my portfolio, doing a bit of filtration processes, checking whether the positions that I had on my watch list outside of the Aussie dollar, US dollar explained earlier why we're not going to be looking at that this week so that's on the burner um, but cats with frank checked out relative wise so we're actually looking at potentially taking a position so we're going to make sure that the position exposure limits we're not going to go up to them probably start off with a starter position 25 percent or so mm -hmm. um so tomorrow morning probably wake up and have a look what the price is saying and see maybe enter that position that's wicked so that looks good for anyone watching and they don't know what a starter position is, Marcus can explain this for you. <laughs> starter position, very simple, is whenever you have an idea, whatever you limit yourself to your position limit, and let's say your position limit is, um, if you're trading currencies, maybe 20 to 30% of your gross exposure level. Gross exposure level is your maximum leverage you're taking. So if you're trading specifically currencies, you want to be leveraging around eight, which is more than equities because it's at least a less volatile market. Mm -hmm. So let's say you leverage around eight. Hmm. Simple, best way to explain it. Let's do an example. You've got a 10 grand trading account. You want to take a degree of eight level exposure, which means that you can 
trade with up to eighty thousand mm-hmm. pound. Your single position limit will be like twenty percent, so twenty percent of that eighty thousand. We can work that on a calculator, but let's just say argument stake. We're on a hundred thousand, so it's about twenty grand position limit. Mm-hmm. If I say I'm starting a start position, it means it will be twenty five percent of that twenty grand number. So you cool. Know, a quarter of that, so maybe five grand as my position potentially. Um, that's the way I would scale my positions and I always start small and mm-hmm. I only scale in if it starts moving in my favour the first couple of weeks every month then I actually break my limits if it actually goes a lot in my favour but you know that's what will be covered in the academy risk phase. management stuff we'll cover all of this in the uh, academy so if you're actually interested in that then obviously you need to be signing up on that <laughs> word list so yeah mate yeah that's so wicked let's see what you got written down then oh okay so this is what I've got written too bad i was just researching a few things to do with the quality coefficient or coefficient rather okay what's that so essentially misconception how you can value an equity and you can basically graham's going over earnings per share and how that was misconstrued into a whole reel of things that actually misvalue and there's a unknown quality or coefficient that you have to multiply by your earnings per share calculation which actually makes up the remainder of whether you value the company or not, and it goes into a multitude of factors. Oh. Um, so I was just researching that, basically, and you combine all those things and actually come up with a better value for a company. Is that that multiplier thing? He mentions it in Intelligent Invest, actually, but I'm not sure if it's the same thing. Potentially, potentially. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so essentially, just a little bit of research around that. Um, getting to know it a bit more because I'm so used to a top-down approach and this is more of a bottom-up approach so it's always good as traders to look at the other side of the uh, field where obviously we've got a good macroeconomic background and being able to look at things from that perspective then go into our industries respectively and trade the equity market but from this side looking at it as a value perspective in a value investing approach where you're going straight into the financial statements and looking at the cash flow forecasts and making sure that they're equivalent to their actual profits and whatnot. It's a different way of getting your mm. sort of stock or equity pop portfolio populated to find capital. So uh, I actually do find it quite interesting. That's I'm enjoying good. it a lot, so I might start implementing these methods into my portfolio eventually once I get to grips with it a lot better. I think that's really good. Yeah. So what's the major thing that you think you've learned today? major thing that I've learned today is that if you're a new about investing, drop your money in an index fund. I'm only joking. <laughs> I already knew that a long time ago. <laughs> the, main, the main thing is uh, there's quite a few principles here that I was picking up on on uh, how you actually come up with a quality coefficient, which is, um, oh, I've lost it now actually. Find it. <laughs> I haven't actually learned it then, have I? But essentially, uh, what you want to be looking at is how does the company function? Um, how do they actually earn their profits? So I think Buffett goes over it briefly. Um, obviously, he learned from Graham. Um, if it's a real estate investment trust, you should be looking at their assets in terms of valuing that company, not looking at their profits and losses because it won't give you any valuable information. So there's no cookie cutter way of actually looking at a business and valuing it because you've got to look at how it generates its money, what's its objective as a business, mm. and are the sort of managers of that business, do they have incentivization to actually execute what the objective of the business is? And that will allow you to come up with a quality co- coefficient then. That's that my sense. understanding of it at the moment. So we'll see where we can take so it. So it's like an indirect way of valuing, basically. Yeah, but it's the essentially a really good method then of having an edge on the market because now you're using your qualitative assessment on what's going on mm. so it, you you obviously got your financial statements and making sure cash flow equals up and then you're also looking at hmm, actually can I 
look at this from a perspective and determine is it worth even looking at the profits and losses because does that matter to this business mm. is it going to affect it is this what makes it a good business or not and these are sort of questions that I'm starting to look into a lot more now in the equity market so true portfolio. something I picked up on on the intelligent investor when I was really reading it was like how they adjusted their earnings I think it was their earnings so they told the enterprising investor or the aggressive investor yeah. to choose big companies that were reliable with I think it was the profits and earnings ratios and the uh, multiplier I'm not sure what this multiplier is mm -hmm. but essentially what he was saying was if you can find what the company is generating what the company is generating the profits from like you said but then finding out if in the future they'll be generating more profits from a new source so let's say in this age for Facebook mm -hmm. could be the Libra their virtual currency their new cryptocurrency yeah yeah could that be a source of new revenue for them a potential really large source and is that price into the stock so that's I think that's what Graham was trying to get into there, but obviously I have to reread that, but it's an interesting topic. No, no, that does make sense. You know, yeah. looking at these blue chip stocks, a lot of, uh, you know, you start at one side when you're a complete layman mm -hmm. and you're like, yeah, I'm going to invest in Netflix, I'm going to invest in Facebook. You go through sort of a strict analysis process, you realise that actually, you know, it's quite difficult to do that. You know, prices are generally overinflated if it's popular. Um, and then you get this other side which you've just referenced is people actually become scared when big companies start enterprising into new areas. For example, Libra is a great example. Headlines that all I'm seeing is Libra is not going to work. It's trying to replace the US dollar as a reserve currency. Um, there's no chance it's ever happening. Mm -hmm. And when I see headlines like that, it's actually sort of confidence index for me that potentially this might have some value. Obviously, you have to understand why they have those negative outlooks. Hmm. But if the rest of the market is looking at it negatively, it means that there might be a good value investment here. They're venturing to a new sector, which will provide additional revenue income for the company. And not many people are liking it or attracted, so they're not putting money into the company based on this. Hmm. So when I'm looking at, I'm looking at that in that perspective, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe this blue chip stock might actually become a good value investment um, if I were to take this approach. Mm, that makes sense quite a contrarian that. view then contrarian view on the market um, because usually the market's what determines the price right it's mm. the market it's where Graham's works <laughs> you know what I'm on about there yeah, yeah that's really good so what else do you think you've got planned for today it's um, quite late now yeah it's getting quite late it's around 10pm um, I think I'm going to probably head upstairs relax for a bit maybe uh, play a few video games I don't know some YouTube unwind a bit and <laughs> essentially yeah and then try and get an early start tomorrow wake up at half five get started with the day be good carry on with chess we'll see you there then yes mate hey what's up mate <laughs> what's right, up what's time up time for a little chill session now let's turn the music down don't want to wake up the neighbours and I'm actually going to play some TFT so if any of you watching know what that is Team Boy Tactics, part of League of Legends. Used to love this game back in the day. We may actually won tournaments playing it, so it's obviously a big pivotal part of my life and I enjoy playing it still. So let's That's find it. a match. You can't get away from it. <laughs> That's it. If you got a skill set, it's hard to lose. This is the sweat fest. Yeah. 